on Business Incorporated today. Egypt imports requirements suspended for rice, beans and lentils. Zimbabwe government orders review of levies on petroleum products. And Cameroon gets uh, 113 million pounds for road projects. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Well, let's kick off as usual with market numbers from Africa. Trading was mostly in the red as intraday Nigeria's main index was down 0.08%. Also following that trend was the JSC of South Africa. That's dipped by 2%. Similarly, Egypt's EJX tumbled 30 by 1%. Meanwhile, Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Friday's trading session in the positive uh, sentiment what it was up 0.76%. Over in the Middle East now, trading activities uh, was also in the red. Abu Dhabi index fell 0.44%, while Dubai's main index declined by over 1%. Still within the region, Saudi Arabia and Qatari exchanges and not left out of that red splash. Saudi Arabia index fell 0.41%, while Qatar index dipped 0.13%. Let's go to Europe now, where, as we expect, uh, stories around there is very much connected to the war going on in Ukraine as uh, European countries look at how to protect consumers in the midst of increasing pump prices and energy. Well, we have Stephen Birdsley now joining us from Berlin. Now, well, Stephen, what kind of, when we talk about uh, increase of price at the pump, what kind of price hikes are we talking about? Well, let's remember, first of all, that even before the war began, there was already a dynamic of rising energy prices and a lot of concerns across Europe about it, as well as efforts to provide relief to households, especially in the area of gas. Well, now those markets are even crazier. Gas prices really taking off despite that continued supply coming from Russia. And that's based on market fears. They're already pricing in the possibility that those that those uh, resources could be pulled back. And so what we're seeing is an even uh, higher uh, bill that's going to come to consumers. We had one German government minister saying yesterday that they could estimate as much as 2,000 euros more a year is what the uh, average single-family home could pay in gas costs. That's obviously a massive burden. And when we look at gasoline, petrol, that's affected, of course, by the global price per barrel of oil. And that has a lot of things that play into it. One is that many purchasers don't want to buy Russian oil right now, so that's been taken off the market. And that makes the existing supplies more expensive than you have OPEC Plus refusing to really deviate from their production plan right now. So it means that the, that dynamic isn't going to change in the short term. Uh, and so that means that prices at the pump are really going up high. What we've talked about here, what we've seen here, I should say, is that within about a week, uh, drivers in Germany are paying 19 euros more uh, to fill up a 50 liter gas tank with unleaded. They're paying almost 30 euros more for diesel. Um, that's really interesting because diesel has always been a bit cheaper here um, than unleaded. And the reason that it's now more expensive is because more purchases of heating oil, which is closely related to diesel oil, are taking place on the market. That's limiting what gets used for diesel. And of course, the reason those purchases are being made is because gas has gotten so expensive. So you have this ripple effect that goes from one market to the next, and it's really driven uh, everything uh, into sort of a, a crazy kind of area that we haven't seen before. Yeah, well, 90 uh, euros and 30, those are really high. But there's also the talk about uh, protecting the consumers in the midst of this. A lot of these plans are still formative right now. We haven't really seen hard, hard plans. What we know from the past few months is that many governments have taken, uh, undertaken relief efforts for household bills. Some of them have actually attempted to cap what utilities can charge for electricity. Um, across the EU as a whole, there's talk about uh, putting a cap on gas prices, um, but that's seen as possibly disincentivizing uh, gas imports from liquefied natural gas, which is seen as a substitute for uh, the gas that's coming in from Russia. So they're always affected 
effects that could happen, sort of second uh, and third tier effects that could happen from any of these price decisions. Um, and what we're also seeing with petrol, with gasoline, is that there's talk here in Germany about possibly putting in a rebate at the pump station itself, at the gas station itself. And the way that would look is that the price per liter would probably be capped at two euros, what the, what the consumer would pay, and then the gas station would be reimbursed the difference by the government. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of this idea already. Uh, a lot of people saying that this just encourages people to continue spending a lot of money on uh, harmful uh, fossil fuels that, of course, uh, have a high carbon content and that they're not actually going to pull back on their consumption. Then, of course, it benefits perhaps the, uh, the oil majors themselves who are setting those prices, of course, dependent on uh, global markets. So that's a long way of saying we haven't yet seen the final answer for how things are really going to come out. Yeah, that sounds like subsidy, which Nigeria is trying to do away with at this time. Uh, but first day of the week, uh, how's the market looking? Well, right now there is, uh, despite uh, this uptick in Russian attacks uh, in Ukraine, what we're, what we're uh, seeing is that oil has actually backed off and the markets could actually improve today because there is a bit of optimism uh, just vir by virtue of the fact that there is ongoing discussions between the governments of Ukraine and Russia. So that optimism already working into markets. What's interesting is going to be um, how what's happening in Asia is going to affect the markets today. Uh, Asia and in, in, in Hong Kong, we've seen a massive loss so far, and that's based on um, a lockdown across Shenzhen. That's one of the big production cities uh, for tech components in China. That's going to have an immediate effect on products such as uh, iPhone, on suppliers such as Apple. Um, and then there's also some other reasons to be concerned for the tech sector. Uh, the Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong is really taking the brunt of that. And whether that passes along to, uh, to the broader markets, global markets, will have to be seen. Some other things that will be driving the markets today. The war is the big thing. Developments in the war will continue to be the big factor, but also uh, that meeting of the Federal Reserve this week, uh, where they're expecting to raise the interest rate uh, that will also have uh, a big effect on markets. All right, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for that update. We'll certainly be watching the space and especially because of uh, the outbreak of COVID in China. Thank you so much, Stephen. Let's go to the UK now. The refugee scheme for Ukrainians is expected to cater for tens of thousands fleeing the war. Well, we have Juliana joining us now to give us uh, for one out of many things. The details of this scheme. Hello, Juliana. What are the details of this refugee scheme? Good afternoon, Inni. So uh, thus far, there are two routes uh, for Ukrainian refugees who are fleeing the conflict to get into the UK. The first uh, route, which has been heavily criticised, um, is this uh, family route. So if you have relatives here in the UK, you can apply via a family visa. At the moment, there are about 3,000 uh, Ukrainians who have been able to do that. Um, there are about 70,000 Ukrainians already living here in the UK, and uh, lots of people are criticised the Home Secretary Priti Patel for being too slow and for the system uh, for being too bureaucratic. So over the past couple of days, Michael Gove, who's a very senior cabinet minister here in the UK, he is uh, the minister for levelling up. He has devised a scheme um, whereby if you are a British or if you're a resident here in the UK, you can uh, allow a Ukrainian family to come and live in your home. And now the scheme has actually only been piloted today. Um, we're in a phase one system and already there have been over 35,000 applicants. Um, you will receive £350 per month. Uh, bear in mind, you have to uh, go through a series of checks. So even though uh, some people have um, held this scheme as uh, being uh, pretty timely and quick to be able to get people in here, there are still a lot of barriers you have to go through. Uh, you have to make sure you've obviously got the space to house uh, these individuals. You also uh, need to make sure that you can name the individual that you want living in your home. Now, that uh, for some charities is just too much. How is somebody in the north of England, for example, going to be able to name an individual in Ukraine that is, is, is going to be able to live in their home? That's the issue. But I think what the government are trying to do is, is pass this over to charities and individuals who are, are watching the conflict unfold in their home. So perhaps they'll be able to go on social media, uh, get in contact with an individual and name them as a person. So that's going to be taking place. If you are doing that and you live in Britain, you also have to make sure you pass a DBS check, which is basically a criminal record check to make sure that you're all clean and you can do that. And there also has to be checks 
on in the individual coming from Ukraine. Uh, so the open door policy, which we know uh, Britain isn't a, f a fan of, is still kind of in place. I think last week, uh, Priti Patel was saying that, you know, after what happened in Salisbury uh, with, uh, with the poisoning um, of uh, that Russian individual, which ultimately affected British nationals as well, they just don't want to take the security risk. They do believe that some Russians uh, may be able to uh, divert or get into the system and make their way here and uh, create some sort of attack. Now, some people say that's going too far, that we just need to help the 2.4 or 2.7, I believe, million refugees um, who have left um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, but there is a system in place. It is going to take some days. Uh, but we know that Britain is a very charitable uh, a nation. Uh, so many people have already offered um, uh, their homes up, their bedrooms up so that they can house uh, these individuals. But before we start seeing the flood of refugees coming in, there are so many boxes that need to be ticked, I's that need to be dotted, T's that need to be crossed. But at least a system is underway. Yeah, it's underway. And like you noted, it's the first day, so I'm sure uh, there may be adjustment, you know, along the way. Well, uh, is the market still reacting to the war in Ukraine or is it the interest rates in the U.S. now? Uh, well, uh, the, the markets are reacting to the war in Ukraine. Just hearing what you were discussing in Germany, yes, the, I think uh, the headline, although it's buried beneath um, all of uh, the destruction, is that uh, there are substantial uh, progresses being made in uh, peace talks. The Ukrainian President Vladimir uh, Zelensky has indicated that he will be meeting uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Whether this will happen, we don't know. Whether it's safe enough uh, for it to happen is another thing. But that seems to avoid investors in the square mile today. So the FTSE All Share is up. It's up by 0.39%. The FTSE 100 also up by 0.27%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, triple digit rises by 1.07%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently uh, up against the US dollar uh, by 0.11%. Uh, it's actually down against the US dollar. It's also down against the euro by 0.40%, but up against uh, the Japanese yen um, at intraday. All right, thank you so much, uh, Juliana. And you know, that talks between the two presidents, we we're certainly praying for peace because <laughs> the world is uh, feeling the impacts of the war. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Let's move to Asia now, where shares in Asia Pacific were mixed today as investors monitored a COVID wave in China. Hong Kong Hang Seng's index, it's dropped by almost 5% on the day to 19,531. 0.66, leading the losses among the region's major market as Chinese tech stocks took a beating. Ten cents fell, 9.79%. Alibaba slipped 10.9%, and Meten plunged 16.84%. The Hang Seng Tech Index tumbled over 11%. Mainland Chinese stocks closed lower, with the Shanghai Composite down 2.6%, while the Shenzhen component shed. 3.08%. China is currently undergoing a wave of COVID infections, its worst outbreak since the country clamped down on the pandemic in 2020, and major cities, including Shenzhen, are rushing to limit business activity. South Korea's cost we also dipped almost 1%. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 climbed 0.58% to close at 25,307.85, while the Topics Index advanced almost 1% also. The S&P AX200 in Australia gained more than 1%. MTSI's Brodex Index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan fell more than 2%. In the United States, stock features rose in early trading ahead of important week as the Russia-Ukraine war continues to escalate and the Federal Reserve could hike rates for the first time since 2018. Features on the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained more than 1%. S&P 500 climbed almost 1%. NASDAQ 100 features traded just about half a percentage. U.S. Treasury also sold off, pushing yields sharply higher. The benchmark 10-year yield jumped more than 8 basis points to 2.08%, its highest level since July 2019. The two-year rates climbed 7 basis points to 1.82%, and 1 basis point to equal 0.01%. Meanwhile, the Fed is expected to raise its target Fed funds rate by a quarter percentage point zero at the end of its two-day meeting, which ends on Wednesday. Investors are also looking at the central bank for its new forecast for rates, inflation, 
and the economy, given the uncertainty from the escalated geopolitical tensions. In the oil space, now prices fell by around $5 today as investors paint hopes on diplomatic efforts by Ukraine and Russia to end their conflict, while a surge in COVID-19 cases in China spooked the market. Brent was down $4.94 at $107.72 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures slid $5.92 to trade at $103.41 a barrel. China, the world's largest crude oil importer and second largest consumer after the United States, is dealing with a surge in COVID-19. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to the African continent to stay with us. This is Business Incorporated on Channel 7. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated on Channel Television. Let's start with Nigeria. Now, there are reports that banks may be hoarding foreign currencies in preparation for the proposal of the central bank to hold supply of forex to the banks by the end of this year. Well, to give us some insights into that, we have Ayokunde Olubumi. He's the head financial institutions ratings with Augusto and Co. Hello, Olubumi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Henry. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. So how true is it that banks are rationing foreign exchange uh, in preparation for this uh, halt by the CBN by the end of the year? Okay. I don't think the report is completely true. Because if you check the Altis 200 policy of the CBN, which is actually, it was the launch of the policy where the CBN governor made a statement that exactly. was actually this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But if you check it, it's meant to actually lapse over the next, so the next five years. It's not something that the CBN is saying. They're going to force the supply of our currency into the market now. What the CBN is just trying to do is, uh, try, is saying that, look, can we see how we can actually increase the contribution of non oil exporters into the market? And from there, CBN can gradually pull back. And let's even also note that CBN started this policy passively since 2016. Recall the 41 buying items, and even last year, the CBN stopping, I'm sorry, the supply of FX to the PDC segment of the What the CBN is trying to do is that look, can we ramp up the supply by non oil sources? And then from there, CBN can gradually withdraw from the market. And then the, the suppliers of the FX, which are the exporters, and the bank can come together and then they can actually even. But the, the CBN had said that they will stop supplying um, FX to them, to, that's the, to the banks, by the end of the year. Now, could you help us paint the picture of how the system will work by then? Okay. Now, let me also, let's also repeat, I don't think it's going to happen. Because if you check the market fundamentals, it's obvious that it's not going to happen. Even okay. if you check the out 200 policy, right? What we have there is saying that, look, for the next 20, next two to three years, because the truth is that the non oil sources that, is, that are, the non -oil sources that are meant to even provide FS into the market, they can't actually meet the current demand that we have now. But what we are going to see, right, it might even be before the end of the year, is gradual facing out of the role of the CBN. So you can see some FX window might actually even be, be actually be closed. The CBN will not be providing funding for. Right? So even the honest truth is that even now, as it is happening, because now CBN is not providing FX equally to all of the sectors. It's not all activities that CBN actually even for. Some are given priority more than one. So what you see now is actually what we see um, the CBN gradually facing it out. But back to your question, what, we are, what the CBN is trying to do is that, look, can, this, can the banks encourage the exporters? Can the banks talk to the exporters such that the export proceeds can be sold to the banks? Right. So when the banks actually even buy those FX from the ex from the um the FX from the exporters, right? From there you can use it to actually meet the demand of your customers. Right? And then we can actually see a, a gradual reduction in the reliance of the CBN as the sole provider of FX into the market. So what we are going to see gradually is increase in the role of um, exporters. We are talking about the non-oil exporters. In providing FX to the market. And if you recall that, if you check the RT, um, RT 200 um, um, policy, right, there is now a rebate for the exporters. If you sell your FX into the, in term, if you sell the FX to the banks through the higher new window, you have a 65 naira uh, um, per dollar, right, for every dollar that you sell. 
And if you sell the FX or use it to meet your own need, right, you have like plus five naira for each for each dollar. And even now, there are more intervention funds that are even coming up to support the exporters. The ultimate goal is to try and see can we try and even increase the right, supply of FX from the non oil exporters. And then from there, because you recall that most of the most of the effects that the CBN is using to supply the market comes from food oil. And you call the challenges that we are having in terms of our production, right? right? That one has actually reduced the amount of effects that we are going to have um, available to the CBN, right? So the aim is to try and even increase the role of non-oil exporters in supplying effects. Well, that's a conversation about increasing the FX uh, from exporters and non-oil exporters or importers has been on the front burner for a while. I wonder what that will do with the increase in the inflation rate in the U.S. Now, that's talking about dollars, but I think it's a conversation for another day. We really have to thank you, Ayokunle Olubimi, Head Financial Institutions Ratings with Augusto Anko. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much for having me. So let's move on now. Talking about central banks, that of Egypt is excluding for one year imports of rice, beans and lentils from the 100% cash margin imposed on most imports. In 2015, the CBE required all importers to fully cover import letters of credit at banks at the time of opening them. The order is applicable from tomorrow, which is the 15th. Oh, sorry, next year, uh, 15th of March, 2023. Meanwhile, the head of the Apparel Export Council of Egypt has revealed that garment exports recorded a remarkable growth in January with a 54% increase to reach $204 million. And that's compared to $132 million in January. Let's move to Zimbabwe now, where the president has ordered a review of fuel levies to avert further price increases as international oil markets continue to be roiled by the war in Ukraine. The president promised that the whole duty framework is being reviewed to cushion the economy from the shocks and pressures rising from fuel prices. Also, the energy ministry will review and, and reduce surcharges on gasoline and diesel. And the UK Export Credit Agency, UK Export Finance, will provide buyer credits and direct lending worth 113 million euros for major road expansion in Cameroon to be carried out by a Canadian contractor using goods and services from the UK. The target is the Douala East Entrance Road that connects the city with ports. The expanded road is, extended, is ex intended to speed the transport of goods and help landlocked neighbours Chad and the Central African Republic. UKEF says that it has up to £2 billion available to support UK exports to Cameroon and can continue to back projects in the Cameroon with its financial support. That's it for this very first episode for the week. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Let's do it again tomorrow. I'm Amy John McQuarrie.